Warning, this podcast may contain graphic and triggering content. Please listen at your own risk. Each individual struggle is different and everyone's recovery and healing journey is different. Please reach out to a certified medical professional if you need help. Welcome to episode 43 of Stomp the Stigma, the podcast aimed to fight the stigma surrounding mental health through education, awareness, experiences, stories, resources, and the vulnerable truth. Joining me to Stomp the Stigma today is Britt from Humble High YYC. She is one of the few people I've met that has BPD as well, so we got to share and compare stories and our experiences We got to talk all about her rage episodes and kind of what a BPD episode looks like for her. We got to compare our night terrors and insomnia, her therapy journey, and kind of the lack of resources that are out there for mental health in general. We got into how BPD affects her everyday life and the importance of support and a buddy or someone you can talk to about it. We touched on mental health in the workplace and finding a good employer that acknowledges the importance of mental health and taking care of yourself. And finally, we got into art therapy and how she uses her art as a coping mechanism for herself. So check out her page on Instagram, HumbleHighYYC, if you're interested to hear more details about her experience with BPD, as well as to check out her art, and you can purchase it on there as well. Hello. How are you? I am so good. How are you? Nice to finally meet you, virtually. I'm really happy. I'm excited to do this. I've never done a podcast before, so. Oh, oh, yes. That (laughs) makes me so much more excited. (laughs) Okay, I've been following your page through my personal account for so long, and I just, like, connect with everything that you post all the time, and I'm like, I need to have her on. I love that. Thank you so much. (laughs) That that account has, like, yeah, it's connected me with some great people and great resources, and yeah, it's been really, really good. Okay, well, I don't know like anything about your story or your journey. I just know that you have BPD and you have like stuff to share. And I'm so excited to like hear and compare. And yeah, yeah. absolutely. What do you want to start with? I guess I'm super curious. Like, do you know kind of how it developed for you? Like sometimes people, it kind of comes on from like past trauma or sometimes it's genetic. Sometimes it's just an environmental thing. Like, do you have any idea how that developed for you? I I do and I don't. I feel like I'm still picking up the pieces that are trying to make it all make sense. That said, like we were just talking about, like I have a pivotal moment in my adolescence mm-hmm. where I think things went awry. Um, and, we, you know, we can talk about that too. I was 14. Um, my parents were going through a really, really ugly divorce. My mom had cheated on my dad. I ended up having to take care of my dad like a child because he was so emotionally distraught. Um, and from what I know about BPD is, you know, it stems from that frontal lobe in the front of your brain. And sometimes that emotional regulation is growing during that adolescent time. And if it gets disrupted, it doesn't grow as much as it should. So I feel like that was kind of the moment where I was 14. I should have been really tapping into my emotional regulation and learning more about, um, yeah, just emotions themselves. And I did it. All my effort and, you know, everything that I had in me was put towards my dad, like in making him feel okay. And that went on for four years. And the next thing I know, I'm in college. So Mm -hmm. I think I missed out on some really pivotal um, development phases, Mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I feel that for sure. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's more as I'm getting older, I start to think about other things like, you know, you read about not necessarily abuse, but just being kind of pushed away by parents when it comes to emotional development. Um, and I feel like that did happen in those few years. My mom wasn't around. I never had my mom there to talk to me about going on dates or if I'm really angry and, and things like that. So I think I was just kind of left on my own. And, and yeah, I, I kind of think about little things more as I get older. It might not be the, the healthiest thing to do, but mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's that's what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I I do that too, actually. Growing up, um, our family, you just didn't talk about anything. Like, you didn't share emotions. You didn't share, like, how you're feeling or 
love or anything. And so yeah. looking back on my childhood, I feel like there was a certain level of like emotional neglect, I feel, that probably contributed to it. Yeah, That's I the word I was looking for, emotional neglect. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's no one really there to teach you or guide you or, mm-hmm. yeah, learn how to express things. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm, I feel like I'm learning that at this stage of my life. Yeah. Which is totally fine, but. Totally. And, I mean, I'm 36 now. Like, I was just diagnosed five years ago, like, when I was 31. Oh. Like, I went, you know, for all of those years. And you know what? I don't think BPD really hit me as much as it did depression and anxiety. Like even when I was in high school and middle school, I was on antidepressants at 15. Like I didn't know what was going on with my brain. And then you're also going through like PMS and getting your period. And it was a wild ride. Um, But I never, I just thought it was anxiety and depression for the longest time until I was about, I would say, Five years before I was diagnosed, I just, I remember this one moment and I was living with two roommates and like two of my best friends and I was looking in the mirror and I remember just looking at myself being, something's not right here. Like something's different in your brain. And I remember just staring at myself like, what is going on in there? And that was kind of the first moment when I was like, okay, something's up. Like, I don't know. My, my brain goes into these weird places. Um, and I mean, you might there's so many different symptoms that I feel and everybody with BPD has different symptoms, of course. Mm -hmm. But for me, I kept my rage and my anger was getting out of hand. Like I could not control it after a while and things were triggering me immensely. So yeah, fast forward, like I leave those two roommates and I'm in a relationship and within, I think two years in my relationship, things got really bad as far as like my rage, anger, um, suicidal ideation, suicidal like tendencies. Um, and I think I was brought to the hospital about two or three times to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And by the third time, that's when I was diagnosed. It was this university professor, still remember his name, Solomon. And he, was just on the emergency unit that night, luckily, and he ended up taking me into a room and he talked to me for three or four hours. And I don't even remember what the hell we talked about. I just know I let everything out. I was, it was a blackout hole. Um, And that was after a suicide attempt. And he came in like 10 minutes after our conversation with a piece of paper and it said, this is borderline personality disorder, all these traits. And I just, I broke down like in the best way, like as yeah. rough as that night was, I was like, Oh my God, I'm not like this, you know, out of this earth, like this only person that deals with these things. I mm-hmm. thought I was the only one. Yeah. It's such a relief when you finally figure out what's going on. Cause were you previously diagnosed with like anxiety or depression before? Yeah, that? both of them. And yeah. I was on pills for both of them, like meds since I was 15. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of knew like there was something else going on. Yeah. Like I'm like, okay, like I know anxiety and depression is bad, but is it this bad? Yeah. Like you'd think people would talk about it more. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know. I just, I knew it was something else. And I actually had like, again, before I was diagnosed, I had a coworker who I was talking to about this and they were like, have you ever heard of borderline personality disorder? And I was like, no, never heard of it in my life. He had had an ex-girlfriend who was diagnosed. So that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. Yeah, and that was like a few years before I was diagnosed. It was just, it's just weird how we grow up and we don't know about these things. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild to me. Well, it's crazy. That's kind of part of the reason why I wanted to start this podcast is because for me, like growing up without any of these resources, it was so hard and I, so isolating and you feel so alone thinking that you're the only one going through this. There's no resources for even my parents to turn to or my family. And so, That's what this is all for. But I feel like there's a little bit of pushback in the system when it comes to mental health. Like, even, like, I don't really know. I don't have teenagers. I don't have kids. But, like, what do they even talk about when it comes to mental health in schools these days? Like, that's just something that's totally... Well, yeah. And and like you said, it's, like, that's why you wanted to start the podcast. That's why I started my art page. It was for two reasons. Mm -hmm. It was to... A, I had so much art building up because I had just started doing art right after I was diagnosed and it was a big, big piece of my therapy. So I it just started building up. So I was like, I got to sell these. But the other reason was I wanted to be open and honest and vulnerable with the little tidbits that are BPD that a lot of people don't understand the dark and the dirty stuff. Yeah. I wanted that to be out in the open and let people know like this is a real thing. I knew I wasn't the only one. And like three years later, the amount of people that I've met 
on, you know, through Instagram of all things yeah. and people that I knew, like people that I've known for 10 years that have come out and been like, oh my gosh, Brett, you have BPD. I had no idea. I was diagnosed yeah. when I was 14. So you end up really getting closer to people that you already knew too. It, it's a great thing to have this out, out in the public and open the conversation. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah, it's you know, too. Like it's, yeah. it's been so nice to have this little group. Do you know a lot of people in Calgary that mm-hmm. have BPD? Yeah, surprisingly. I would probably say I worked in bars and restaurants for a long time. So yeah. I've met like a shit ton of people for over the past like 15 years. Of course, like you're working with a lot of people at one time, but they're mostly people that I've worked with the bar and restaurant industry. Um, I would honestly say like five to eight different people that I've known over the past 10 years, which is crazy. Like to me, it's never heard of it. And then once one person speaks up, the other ones feel a little bit more comfortable. And and I'm happy to make people feel like they're not alone. Oh, absolutely. A lot of people have never heard of BPD at all. No. Like how many times have you probably said to people, yeah, I have borderline personality disorder. And they're like, what? Look at you like you have 12 heads. Yeah. They automatically think that you're bipolar. True. Or, or you're like, or that you have a multiple personality disorder. I find a lot of people go to like the movies. They're like, Oh, you've split personalities or you're on the borderline of something. Like, no, like it literally has nothing to do with borderline. It's very confusing. No. And actually I've heard that some people with BPD do kind of have those like different personalities, but for me, I don't get that. You don't think you don't have that trait? I don't think so. No. They're not like different. I mean, there's so many levels to it for me like I have very 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 much identity distortion like I yeah. I have no idea what I look like what I sound like what I you know how people perceive me if you were to if someone was to ask me to describe myself I would have no idea where to start even from like stupid things from a favorite color to a favorite food like I don't necessarily have a solid identity and that's something that I've been struggling oh, with wow. for a long long time so I mean there's that factor that like I literally have no idea who I am but then there's this mm-hmm. also I call it I hate saying this but I have a demon and I wouldn't say it's necessarily like another personality but it's a very 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 dark side to me that is nothing nothing like to who I am 90% of the time. Um, we actually have a name for her. Her name is Brittany <laughs> instead of Brittany. So she comes out when I'm in the middle of a BPD episode or I'm about to have a BP- BPD episode. I can be the most hateful, disgusting, monstrous human you've ever met. But the weird part is, is I'm so acutely aware of that, that she's taking over my body that I can sometimes verbalize that in between her rage. Like, it's very, very strange. Like, sometimes I'll be in that BPD rage and have her overcoming me, but I'll be able to verbalize to my partner, Brittany's here, Brittany's here, Brittany's taking over, please help me. Like, I actually have to say that. Oh, my gosh. So he'll end up, like, having to, like, come over and, like, give me a hug and put, you know, cold ice on my neck or, you know, different soothing techniques, but I have to sometimes, like, speak through her rage. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. So, but it's not like it's out of the movies. It's totally different. It's not like I snap and I'm somebody else. And I'm sure people, you know, there are yeah. disorders like that, but that's that's not me. So what happens to you in those in those episodes? The episodes are you know, the most heightened form, like you no, know, the worst symptom I would say of BPD. And I don't really know what triggers them. It's usually some sort of miscommunication where I feel like I'm don't I'm not being seen or I'm not being heard or I'm being disregarded. Um, and they usually I, I I black out like I literally I call it a whiteout because it's not like I'm you know it's not like a drunk blackout. It's that I fit, I just don't even know where I am on the earth. I don't know what I'm feeling. You completely lose all of your senses, mm-hmm. and the only thing I can feel at that point is rage. Um, that's me. Like I, I get everybody's super different, but I. I do hit things. I, I don't, I'm not, I've never been a, like a, a cutter or like, a, you know, like a self, a pain inflictor or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do like I've hit things or I, I will, you know, a lot of the time, and I've heard that this is really common when people are in these BPD rages is that you can't feel anything. So you'll do anything to feel something physically. Yeah. Right. So I tend to hit my head against the wall. You know, I've broken, I've almost broken my knee before I've punched things. Um, like just very, very rageful things. And luckily I haven't gotten lately. I haven't gotten like a lot of like suicidal tendencies, but if they are going to come, it's going to be within those, those BPD yeah. rages. Yeah. yeah. And they, they happen. I'm really, I haven't had one in about six months, but for a few years when I was getting diagnosed, probably had one every month. Like it was bad. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. And I actually would like physically run away thinking that if, okay, if I run out of the house or out of the apartment, I'm running away from the episode and mm-hmm. I go and I don't, I wouldn't remember, but I would go run around like downtown and go hide under a bridge. And like one time I had a, a stick and I was sharpening it thinking that someone was going to come kill me. And you start to develop these fears that you're in like a place of war and everybody's coming after you. Yeah. Um, and I still, I still get like that. I actually have night terrors almost. I'd say almost every night it's either insomnia or night terrors and my night terrors are super reflective of my fears in the real world Mm -hmm. um it's so weird it's wild it's a wild (laughs) it's crazy that you bring up night terrors I get uh sleep sleep paralysis no way see I don't get that but I would love to hear about this yeah so I know okay one of my exes used to get sleep paralysis and would see like demons monsters like yes. in the room with us yep. mm-hmm. um I don't quite get that but I get paralyzed and like my eyes are open so I can see where I am I know that I'm in my room in my bed but somebody is there like holding me hostage almost and like I feel like I'm tied up or something and I can't move my body but my eyes are open and I can see everything and I never quite know exactly like who this person is, but I can tell that there's somebody like like a figure. Yeah, kind of. Or I know that there's somebody there. Maybe they're beside me. Do you feel that fear when you're in it? Yeah. Like physical, you can physically feel it. Yeah. I used to. scary. And it's so hard to wake yourself up from it. I used to try and like breathe heavier to get my ex to like wake up and wake me up, but I don't think that ever worked. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, especially, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. But I've gotten to the point where I can recognize when I'm in one of those states. And so I'm like, I know that I'm safe. And I just kind of have to like breathe through it until my body catches up like to my brain up? and wakes up. Crazy. Yeah. I've heard that's really common. I'm I'm really happy I don't deal with that. But I mean, and I've also done, well, I haven't done research, but these sleep issues like sleep paralysis, insomnia, night terrors are really prevalent with people with BPD. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember when I was diagnosed, I was put into a program at Sheldon Schumer and I was assigned a therapist and a, a psychiatrist. And the therapist one week had actually gone to an event in Toronto and it was like, I don't know what, what it was, not like a convention kind of thing for mental health and nurses and things like that. And she actually said she walked into um, one of the auditoriums and they were doing a presentation on BPD and night terrors. She came back and she had all this information for me. It was so, it was, yeah, I, again, I didn't know that, that was like, you know, as aligned with my BPD. So it felt a little bit more normal, but she mm-hmm. gave me some great tips. I definitely get like the insomnia part of it too. I'll yeah. be exhausted like all day, and as soon as I get into bed, yeah. I ding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything is going through your head. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah, so I it really has nothing to do with with your level of exhaustion either. Like, yeah. I could be so tired, and then I hit the sack, and it's just like I'll be up until seven a.m. There's no getting around it. Yeah, my brain is just firing on all cylinders all the time, and I just. I can't sleep and I can't, if I do fall asleep, I can't stay asleep. Yeah, me too. So then like, I never feel rested ever. There's this, um, I got this last year as an app called sleep talk. And because of my, I knew I was having night terrors, but I didn't really know like what was happening. So you turn it on before you go to sleep and it records you and everything it hears throughout the night so then you wake up the next morning and it has all these different clips and recordings of your night and that like painted a very scary picture for my night terrors of like you should like try it for your sleep paralysis oh my gosh do you talk in your sleep well my night terrors like I, I'm, I scream I cry I flail like I wake up and it's like I literally have gone through war I talk it's in my sleep bad. all the time scream bloody murder like scream like I'm surprised the neighbors haven't like called the cops before oh my gosh what that is so crazy I've been told that I talk all the time and I will like sit up in the bed and like slap (gasps) the covers and like oh my gosh I feel so bad for anyone that has slept beside me because that would be terrifying and I don't remember any of it No, that's the crazy part. Our brains are so fascinating. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. Yeah, it's, it's wild. That's I feel like it's one, like my symptoms have gone down. I went to DBT. Have you gone through DBT yet? No. No? Are you going to, do you think? I don't know. I don't really, I'm not going to therapy right now. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, it's definitely like, good. If you, if you find your BPD is getting like out of control and yeah. worse, like definitely look for getting on a, a dialectical behavior wait list I went through it and it's it's hard and it's really scary yeah. but you pick up these tools that no one else could ever give you because like the course itself is built just around borderline it's not for anything else mm -hmm. so it's really tailored and it's actually pretty cool but it was terrifying I get to do a group therapy every week with a group of like 15 people so and it was downtown so it was a lot of like very interesting characters in my yeah. class <laughs> But at first I was like so scared. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? But then like once I got to know them all, it was like one of the best groups I've ever met in my life. Such different people that I would never meet in my everyday world, wow. but I still think about them every day. I'm oh like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Once you kind of hear that people are going through the same thing as you, you're just like instantly connected. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah especially when it comes to mental health, man. Yeah. Totally. Do you remember kind of like the beginning when I don't know how long you've been experiencing this for, but when you kind of first realized that maybe you were experiencing something different from other people or that you kind of maybe had like mental health concerns? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It's like, so my twenties were so fucking fast paced. Like I'm talking, I worked day jobs. I was a teacher for a little bit. And then I started working in restaurants. Um, I would work, you know, from nine to four, go home for two hours and then go work again until four in the morning some nights. And, I, and that's the way I liked it. Like it was just go, 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 go. If you weren't working, you were partying. Like I was never home. I was never alone. Right. Yeah. And then I felt like as soon as that life kind of slowed down when I got out of it, um, that's when everything kind of started to become a lot more evident to yeah. me. I was alone a lot more. I was in a relationship. Um, obviously, you know, things come up when you're in a relationship that don't come up when you're single, just different arguments and different emotions. And things just started to get, like, be unrecognizable. Like, I didn't know who I was anymore. Um, yeah. And, and, and the weird part about it is, is that nobody would have ever known, like, except for my partner, because I would only act out when I was home or with him. Like wherever mm -hmm. I was the most comfortable at work or, you know, being out with friends, like nobody would ever think that anything was happening yeah. because I was so normal. Like, but it's when you're in your comfortable spot. Like my boyfriend got the absolute brunt of this disorder and still does, unfortunately, but he knows that it's not me and he knows that it's like a disease. So yeah. I'm really lucky because I know that relationships are very, very tough when it comes to, to BPD. I actually just bought him a book. <laughs> the one, and it's literally for like people who are in a relationship with somebody with BPD. I don't even, I'm trying to even remember like where, I mean, it, there was just this, this few years where everything was just really bad. Like I would just react to things really terribly. Um, yeah. Like I said, the rage and the anger was my first like telltale sign because I was never an angry person. And then all of a sudden, like I want to hit things left, right, mm -hmm. center out of nowhere. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I think that was my, my big you got to go see a doctor and obviously like the suicidal stuff yeah. that was, that was scary. I mean, I was never really like, you know, I'm going to, I would, I would never really come out and say it, but during one of the episodes I had tried to jump off a four story building. And that was when Jay, Jay had actually grabbed me, my partner and saved me. And that when, when I was taken mm -hmm. to the hospital, the emergency room that third time, and that was the night I was diagnosed. So it could have gone lots of different ways, but wow. I feel really lucky with, the support and the resources that I've received because yeah. I know that a lot of people don't get those. Mm -hmm. Like that's one thing I've noticed with talking to people on Instagram is that they are so lost. They don't know where to get the help where in my case, I feel like it fell in my lap and I don't really like saying that, but it's something that needs to be shared because yeah. it's not the way it goes. You don't just go to a doctor, get diagnosed, get put into a gold star program and you're good to go. Right? Like that's not the case for most people. I lucked out, mm -hmm. um, but it needs to be, yeah, the resources need to be more at hand for people. Even today, like we were just talking about how it wasn't anywhere when we were kids. It's not anywhere now. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy that you say that. When I, I want to say like my second year of university was kind of my lowest point. And like, I really like did not want to be here anymore. And I 
recognize that. And I went to my family doctor and I, I told him like what was going on. And I was like, you need to refer me to somebody. Like I need help. I need to talk to someone. And he told me that because I was an adult, that it was too difficult to get in to see like a psychologist or, or anybody like that. Like, that's all he said to me. Like, he wouldn't like me. refer me anywhere. I'm like, okay, but <laughs> I'm but telling you me. <laughs> that I need help, like, really badly. Yeah. It's, so Yeah, anything. Yeah, that's so sad. It's so but, hard But that, it's sad that it's so typical is the problem. Yeah. Like, I've, been, I've been ghosted by therapists. Like, that's a thing. Like, people will see me and they're like, oh, just, you know, normal broad, like, depression, anxiety, and then... I divulge I have BPD and they will, they'll ghost me. They'll ignore me. Oh I've even like God. called the offices before. I've been like, can you tell me why this therapist won't call me back? Like I had three sessions with her. What did I do? <laughs> yeah, oh. it's like a real thing. Yeah, a lot of people, a normal therapists, like you have to find us like a specialist. You can't just go to any doctor. Like that. I'm even still struggling to this day finding mm -hmm. a specialist. I have a list that I have to like, yeah, I'm still on wait lists at this point. I know I've been thinking about like that I should find a therapist or start talking to a therapist, but I know like how hard it is to find somebody that you connect with. So I'm just like, and that, yeah, that's another I've factor been putting it off, time. but yeah, totally. Yeah. Wow, that's so were, were you in therapy for a little bit? Um, My parents put me in when I was a kid because I would just come home from school like bawling my eyes out and nobody like I didn't know what was going on they had no idea what was going on and yeah. so I saw I don't know if it was a psychologist or a psychiatrist somebody um for a while and then once you kind of seem like you're starting to get better then they're just like oh but you don't I don't think you have to come anymore. And then when I went back to my family doctor to try and get me referred to somebody else, he just told me that it was too hard as an adult. Like it was easier as a child, but it was too hard as an adult. That's all back end stuff, right? Like we don't need to know that. Just give me help. It's so silly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the system is is beyond yeah. beyond broken. And I feel like a lot of work needs to happen. Like even when I was discharged from like the program at Sheldon Schumer I had tried to book like appointment with the therapist that I had been with for two years there and they were just like sorry no like your time's up like you can't like they would yeah. not let me get through to her line not even to like leave a message and this is a therapist I was with for like two years like we had built oh my gosh. this relationship and like they were just like nope time's up you gotta go bye wow yeah yeah so there's definitely it makes me sad to think about there's so many people out there who get that kind of treatment mm -hmm. and like I'm good like I can manage my BPD it's fine but there's a lot of people who can't and they need that help yeah it's just there oh that is so sad, <laughs> yeah. So sad. <laughs> yeah it is it is it is and I get a lot of people who you know they'll ask me like you know where should I go what you know what doctors should I go to and I don't have the answers like yeah I can tell you what I did, but it's not going to happen that way. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I wish there was more I could do. Yeah, I really wish there was more resources available. Yeah, or just specialists, just anything at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. It's a crazy world. You were talking about um, kind of only, I don't know, falling into your episode like when you're at home or when you're somewhere comfortable. I think that's super common, actually. And just like hiding that side of yourself from anyone else when you're out in public, when you're at work or at school or whatever, and just it comes out when you're at home. I think that's mm -hmm. super common. I think so too. Like, yeah, a lot of people kind of just show the worst part of their yeah. their mental illnesses at home to their families and things, which, yeah, I feel like that's, it makes sense for sure. But it's, yeah, it's, I, but I'm off. Oh, yeah. I also don't want people outside of like my home to see those deep and dark moments. But exactly. then when I come out and say, oh, well, I have BPD, I even had people come to me and be like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. You're, you're lying. You're faking it. You're doing it for attention. <laughs> okay. Well, you go talk to my doctor and you go tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People that know me like are shocked to find out yeah. that I have BPD or struggle with anything mentally. Because when I'm out with people, I mean, I'm very social. I'm I'm pretty extroverted. So yeah. that helps me. And going out and hanging out with people helps me. So 
people don't really see that side of me and they would never expect it. Yeah, that's just, that was the same with me too. And yeah. It was a shocker and it still is too. Even like some of my friends, I think they don't even really quite understand the severity of it, but at the same time, they don't need to, right? Like yeah. as long as they're there to support me, I don't want to, I have a big, big problem with like not wanting to burden people mm-hmm. with things. That's just, I don't know. I don't like talking to people about it. Yeah. <laughs> so does your BPD, like it kind of sounds like it's pretty black and white for you. Like you. Oh yeah you're either like you're having an episode or you're not is that what it's like yep, for you it, yeah oh, yeah wow. especially these days you know five like after um going to like therapy like group therapy and stuff it's definitely a lot more black and white I think I've managed to be very aware of the smaller symptoms and be able to like use yeah. the tools that I was taught um you know like a lot of interpersonal relationship stuff um body temperature just regular up and downs like and again it, it it's similar to bipolar in a way that our emotions and our feelings and like just mm-hmm. our brains and our bodies react differently all the time like all 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 the time yeah like i go through every emotion probably every hour wow i would say yeah oh my gosh that is so interesting to me cuz for yeah. me mine doesn't work like that no no i just have I don't know. I have a lot of intrusive thoughts that pop up all the time. And my episodes, I don't know if they're like, I feel like they slowly build up a little bit. Can you feel them coming? Usually, yeah. Usually. And then I'm just stuck in it for however long that lasts. And then. (laughs) It's hard to describe them, right? Like. Yeah. It's, it's. It's every emotion intensified all at once to the point where you are in utter confusion. Your brain is chaos and you can't physically move or do anything. Yeah. Like that that feels (laughs) right to me. Yeah. (laughs) Like you don't know if you're coming or going. (laughs) Yeah. And that you just, at least for me, I feel like I can't do anything. Like I will sit on my bed and like stare at the ceiling for hours. Yeah, me too trying to make sense of things going on in my brain. Yeah. And like being alone with my brain is not the best thing for it. But when you're in one of those moments, like you can't bring yourself to do anything else. Yeah. It's so true. Silence is like for sure one of my worst enemies. Yeah. When I'm by myself or in conversation, like I have a thing, like if I'm talking to somebody and I, and I don't know, I'm trying to get some sort of conversation, they don't say anything, I'm, like, raging inside, and I don't know why, but I'm, like, that's a big trigger for me, like, why are you ignoring me? Wow, yeah, I get inside my head a lot, even when I'm, like, if I'm at work, and I'm working on something by myself, like, there's other people around, but if nobody's talking to me, I just start thinking about, like, what do you do for work? I work in a lab um, in the oh, beer cool. industry. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, like, there's always people around. But if I'm just working on my own experiment or something, then I'm just, like, I get in my head and I'm thinking about anything and everything. But it's usually, like, about how, like, worthless I am. Or, like, you know, like, all the negative thoughts that come in. Yeah. And that, I, I yeah. get what you mean. Because, okay, so your intrusive thoughts are very, like bullying to yourself yeah yeah I I'm the exact same way I do I yeah I say stuff out loud too like I'm the stupidest person ever I'm always making idiotic mistakes and yeah my boyfriend will correct me and be like why are you literally talking absolute shit about yourself yeah well, that's what my brain tells me what am I supposed to think yeah I do that or my intrusive my intrusive thoughts will be like I just want to break stuff like at work I have I'm working with beakers and a lot of glassware and so I'm, I always have to wash it and like carry it to like a different part of the lab and I always like every day I just want to like drop it all on the ground and smash it <laughs> there are those break rooms that's what we need we need one of those break rooms where you can go and just like smash all the antique glass and like oh that's what I need I have that's- seen those and I want to do that so bad because I feel like I would yeah. love that yeah me too <laughs> so fun so do you, do you know, like, what triggers you now? Have you gotten to that point? No. It could be. It, it really, 
it really depends, you know, like I can't, I can't come up with a list of things, of, of things that trigger me. It really depends on, I think there's like all kinds of different factors, like yeah, my environment, I agree. Uh, the amount of sleep I've had, um, yeah. somebody else's energy, yeah. what I've eaten. Like there's so many different things. Oh like God, if I yes. took my meds last night or the day before, like who knows, um, if I get into that zone where like I'm mad and everything's making me mad, I usually know to walk away. Like if I'm around family or like my partner, if I can feel myself getting into a weird zone, but like one thing I've learned is just to walk away and like actually go have a conversation with myself to like assess what I'm feeling. And, and this is something you learn in DB too, is like really tracking down the, the origin of these feelings, like really mm -hmm. going back, you're like, okay, you're feeling rage. You know, you can feel it in your stomach, you're sweating. What actually made you feel that way? Usually it's nothing. So then you yeah. kind of talk yourself out of it. And there's all kinds of different techniques that we've learned. Super valuable. Yes. All of those triggers. Oh, those are the same for me. And I, yeah. don't, I don't entirely know what all my triggers are, but I think a lot of it is internal for me. Like if I oh, haven't been, course. if I haven't been eating very well, if I'm not hydrated, if I didn't get enough sleep, like it, it it's usually from myself. Yeah. That's life though. It sucks, but. I, I try to do all of these things and do all of the right things, eat right and move around and take my meds and do this and that. But no matter what I do, like my BPD is still going to be there. It's yeah. not like, it's not like I eat an apple and my disease is gone. <laughs> so it's like you can try so, so, so hard. But no matter what I do, it'll always, always be there. Mm -hmm. And that's something you just kind of have to live with. Like I know it's going to come back at some point. But for right now, I'm good. Like you said, like I'm pretty black and white. So I'm lucky. But I like I say that, but I also think I'm so good at managing my symptoms that sometimes I don't even know they're there. You know what I mean? True. Yeah. Like. Yeah, like my days are so, 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 so up and down, but they're so normal for me that I wouldn't even classify that as a bad day anymore. Like it's just so, yeah. that's just too, yeah. I wake up with anxiety. I freak out 4,000 times a day, but inside, internally, yeah. only. But that on the outside, I'm like, dee, 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 dee. <laughs> <laughs> that's la, la, la. such a good point. I think as I've gotten older and as I'm kind of understand what's happening to me and what is kind of like my BPD normal, I guess. Yeah. Um, you don't really, yeah, it doesn't come as quite a shock anymore. Yeah. It becomes a normal. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, yeah, it's, it's crazy, but it's weird because you only think about that when you really step back, but like, yeah, I know my days are definitely still full of BPD. Yeah. <laughs> like I actually have gotten really open with it with my recent, like I've started with a new company in January. So I'm very open with it with my boss and my colleagues these days because we work so closely virtually like mm -hmm. all day that like I had to be open with them about it because I can't work for a regular, I mean, I could, but it's going to be a challenge for me. I can't work at an office. I can't work in an organization. I don't work nine to five. I can't work eight hours consecutively. That's just yeah. not who I am as a human being. So I work remotely. I'm a contractor. I work very, very flexible job, which is great. But like the reason why I do that is because my days are so chaotic with BPD that I've got, I had to make my life work for it. Like yeah. I had to. But like if I, for example, my night terrors, if I have a night terror, when I wake up, whenever I do wake up, I can get stuck in them. But my day is totally off. I actually, yeah. like in my mind, there's people outside with guns like ready to kill me. Not actually, like I'm not hallucinating, but that's the feeling yeah. that like things are very, very dark. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually can't jump into work right after that. It's impossible. Yeah. So, you know, I'll have like. I'll take a slow morning and have three hours in the morning to get into like my focus. And it's, it, it's different every day. Yeah. And like my, my emotions are so intensified that if, again, like if my factors are really low, like I hadn't eaten, I hadn't really had a lot of water, it's cloudy out and something crazy happens at work. I'm like that, whether it's I'm mad, frustrated, confused, sad, that emotion is going to be intense by like a thousand times. Yeah. Wow. I, a flexible schedule like that would be would be so much easier. I've had to take like days off because I can't just yeah. I I can't handle it sometimes. 
and you should be able to like, that's good. Yeah. And I hope that they understand that. Like, that's why I created this career, like this remote, yeah. like I'm in marketing and social media. So I worked in marketing agencies when I was getting diagnosed and when I was going through my treatment and it was a whole other traumatic experience trying to explain that to an employer. Yeah. Like he had no understanding, no respect If anything tried to make my life worse. I'd be like going to my therapy session and I would get a text from him halfway when he knew I was there. It was almost like he was poking and trying to see mm -hmm. if it was real. Like it was very, very, very odd. But I was oh at that point, I was like, no, nope, never working for anybody ever again. <laughs> who doesn't understand mental health. I'll yeah. never, ever work for somebody who without like a very opening conversation and like a, a really like upward sense of understanding I'll never work with them yeah to work for an employer that doesn't understand mental health or is I guess just not open to it like I don't think I could do that yeah no I, I can't I, I, I still have such bad feelings about it it was awful like you're already going through enough the last thing you need yeah. to me to feel like is that you're a lying or doing something for attention. Like, no, I'm actually trying to fucking survive here. And I really, exactly. it gets to the point where I'm like, I don't care what you think anymore. You just have to put yourself first. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah. That would be tough. People need mental health days. Yes. For real. I agree. If you okay. have an understanding employee, you are very lucky and ahead of the game. <laughs> it's very rare. They're like, they're somewhat understanding. I mean, I don't have mental health days. I just have to like take time off, okay. but yeah. I mean, my coworkers are really good about it. And during well, this, that's all I need is a little yeah. support network too. Yeah, like yeah. during this pandemic, um, they kind of split up our crew just in case somebody got sick. Then they had a backup crew, and so yeah. I ended up working with one other person for like a year and a half. And so we got really close and got to talk about our mental health and. How we, but, we both kind of struggle. And so now we have this like really good understanding of like if you need space or you need time off or like you have that. Yeah. It's good. Just even even that one person is yeah. so important just to let them in and let you know that, you know, yeah, it's, it's almost like a buddy system. It does. It makes yeah. you feel a lot more comfortable. Absolutely. Really Ever since I started talking to my boss about it, it's been life's just a lot more clear I can be open about it I can be honest I don't have to lie I used yeah. to lie all the time and just say I was like oh I got food poisoning I'm gonna take the day off and I was like no I'm not sick down here I'm sick up here and it's, that should yeah. be okay to say like why do you have to lie about that it makes no sense yeah yeah absolutely. I can't control it like you shouldn't have to hide it or worry about kind of like backlash from from work no. Yeah. But that's what we have implanted in us too, right? Exactly. Attendance records, work every day. Like it's mm -hmm. a little much. That's just kind of how we were ingrained to think is like yeah. show up or don't show up at all. <laughs> yeah. There's such a stigma around even taking time off Yep. and taking mm -hmm. that time to like relax and recharge, but you need it so bad. Yeah. I found a company like the company I work for now is so great with that. They prioritize our livelihood over our clients, which we oh, obviously yeah. like we take care of our clients, but our leaders and our bosses are very much like they're there to take care of us and the clients come second to them. If there's, if we need a break or if our capacity is too much, um, they're there to hop in and like, let us take those days off. Mm -hmm. They're very much like, if you've done any work today, please go for an hour walk. Um, it's great. Like it's insane. We actually have like an on-call therapist that she hired. So if anybody needs like counseling, she pays for it. Like what? What? That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So there are employers out there who see the value like in giving you that freedom yeah. to, you know, to, you have to better your mental health. It's so oh important for your work. And she knows that we work better when we're not stressed out. And when, if we need to walk away, we walk away. If we need a week off, we got a week off. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's crazy. It really shapes your world in a totally different way. I, oh, wow. I can't even imagine like yeah, a workplace so like that. <laughs> wow. Okay, I want to go back. Um, you were talking about uh, how you kind of like don't really know who you are. Do you find yourself like trying new things all the time to kind of 
figure that out? Because I've heard that from some other people with BPD. Yeah, I mean, in a sense. <laughs> Here's the thing. There's the whole identity thing again. It's like I could literally go either way with every question. Like sometimes <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know what? I do try a lot of new things. And then another side of me is like, no, I really do the same things all the time. <laughs> like I have no idea who I am. Like that literally just touches on the identity, you know, dysmorphia the same way. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't really do much these days, to be honest. Like, I'm pretty stuck in my ways. When mm-hmm. I was younger, though, I would do anything. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of comfort in routine. And I think routine, I mean, routine helps me for sure. Because mm-hmm. then I, I know what's happening. I think that's right. part of the anxiety side of things is like, I know what's going to happen. And I know what's going on in my day. Yeah, me too. Routine, the fear of the unknown but... is probably a trigger that like yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I don't like, I don't really try new things, but I know like there's definitely people out there who, again, like they're trying to figure out who they are as a person. I'm sure I did that a lot in my 20s and I just never found the way. So here I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like in my mind, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty introverted, simple lady these days, but <laughs> it's, it's more of like, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe this isn't normal for other people. But, like, does everyone probably knows what, like, what their favorite color is or, like, what type of personality they have or what style they have. Like, I have no idea. Like, I just, I have no idea. And I don't know. Maybe that's normal. I, wow. I don't know. <laughs> do you think you ever will? Um, I hope so. Honestly, I do. I would yeah. love to have a clear image of, like, who this person is that I've been living inside, you know, for 36 years. Mm-hmm. But... No, it's something I still grapple with. But at the same time, it's like, do I need to? Yeah. I'm pretty content. That's true. Yeah. Totally. Wow. I'm good. <laughs> Most people have never even heard of BPD, right? Like, oh, We already said that. But is there something about BPD that you want people to know? Like people that are listening that have never heard of BPD before. Is there something that you would tell them? Yeah. If you have somebody in your life who has BPD, take the time out to learn. Just learn a little bit about it. Um, You're never going to understand it, even when you do put the effort in to learn. It's just people with BPD, they need a lot of love. They need a lot of seriously, like, tender, loving care. And And it's not like, and when I say this, sometimes... I'm like, oh my God, I'm so needy, but you know what I am. And if that's, <laughs> if that's what BPD has made me, then that's okay. Yeah. But when I get into a dark, dark zone, usually the only thing I need is for someone to come to me and say, everything's okay. This is all in your head. This is your BPD. Yeah. You're going to be okay. Like that, like it rarely happens, but when that does happen, that's usually my ticket. And I think it's all just about empathy and sympathy, sympathy and understanding and learning. That's really the only thing I would say. Yeah. Like it's the same thing with my family. Like they didn't, they're on the other side of the country, which is really tough. And over the past couple of years, they've gotten some really scary calls and they're like, you know, we were never the family to talk about mental health. Um, so when I was diagnosed, I like forced them to read different articles and watch yeah. different movies and different resources. And the change in attitude from my mom, my dad, and my brother was night and day. Like, oh, wow. I don't want to say they like cater to me a lot more, but they like are definitely when they call me, they're like, how is your BPD? Everything going good. And when I am having a really like hard week, they know how to talk to me and they know how to like smooth it out and say the things that I need to say. So it took them years to figure it out what I need and what that sweet spot is but Mm -hmm. it's yeah like I said just learn just take the time to learn if you really love them learn I love that that makes me so happy I'm glad that you have um that support system yeah it's tough it like for my dad too like and it's funny because my dad was very not rigid like he was he's exactly the same as me as a human like we're both very emotional but he was never really in tune with it and I've totally brought that out of him. Like, he'll call me and be like, I just took a nap and I woke up and I'm feeling sad. So I'm going to go and have a, you know, I'm going to go have a walk. And I thought I would call you Aww. just to hear your voice. Like, you can tell he's so in tune with his emotions now. And I'm like, oh, that makes me so happy. I love it. That, that he could call so me when he's feeling down too. I'm like, oh, be open. I love it. No. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank God. <laughs> okay, a lot of people with BPD also struggle with like other illnesses or challenges I guess like for me I have hyperact no what's it called (laughs) I don't know anxiety and (laughs) and depression and I'm starting to think that I have 
um, ADHD as well. I saw you did like a podcast with somebody with ADHD and I want to watch that one. Yeah, it was, oh, it was so interesting. Like, I feel like I connected with her so much too. One of my best friends has ADHD and it's the same thing. Like I had to take time out and learn about it. Right. And like, it's, it's more than just like not being able to focus. There's a lot of like emotional intensity to ADHD too, which I didn't really, I didn't know. Like it can put you into a depression because you're so overstimulated all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Which I didn't know. Like again, learning. That happens to me all the time. Yeah. I don't, I haven't experienced anything with ADHD. No, I don't know much about it. Yeah. Personally. And I've heard a lot of people with BPD experience eating disorders as well. Yeah. I mean, I haven't in my adult age. I think when I, like before even like my parents were divorced, I had like a year of weird body dysmorphia and like a Mm -hmm. weird, a weird eating habit regime that I can think about. Like me and my girlfriend were really weird with it. I feel like (laughs) it was, it was just a phase though. I think we thought we were really cool, like not eating for a day. But anyways, that went away really fast. Thank God. Um, I don't really have any issues with that stuff. And I haven't right. in a long time. For me, it's it's my anxiety. Like, my anxiety is really bad. Like, I have such – it's the anxiety you see out of movies. Like, I'm scared of movie theaters. I'm scared somebody's going to come in and shoot us. Like, mm-hmm. I have to pick very specific seats. Um, big crowds, I will white out instantly. If I'm in, again, like, the wrong environment, I will, like – literally stop remembering stop seeing and just find an exit and end up somewhere that I don't know where I am um yeah my anxiety gets really bad around certain people that's very yeah my anxiety will be there forever so crowds for you oh yeah crowds loud sounds too like repetitive loud sounds will again like it'll just like shock it'll like it's such a shock to my system that I don't see anything or hear anything Mm -hmm. yeah so stampede's like a big no-no for me yeah (laughs) That was actually where I experienced my very first panic attack was at a tent during CP. Oh my gosh. So yeah, and it was the same thing. I just remember like panicking, doing that whiteout thing, like where I don't know where I am or what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden I was like two blocks away crying on a rock. Like I had no idea. I just got out of there. That's all I remember. Oh my gosh. Do you still experience panic attacks? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh wow. Quite frequent. Not frequently, but um, I'm pretty sure... When did I have one? Oh, I had one in Nashville, like last week. I was in Nashville for a wedding, and there was just too much going on and too many groups of people and going to different places, and mm-hmm. I just, yeah, I had a full-on breakdown and had to go back to the hotel. Oh <laughs> but yeah, too much going on, change of plans, yeah. um, things like that will just throw me, throw me for a loop. That's like the norm. Wow. Part of the norm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what are your coping mechanisms that help you through through all of that? Again, I'm super introverted. I have like three things that I do. One is going for a walk. There's no music, no nothing on me, just breathing and being super aware. Breathing, smelling, seeing, and like yeah. noting all those things in my head. Um, that usually takes me out of it. Temperature control is a big thing too. So ice, either right here on your third eye, they call it, or the mm-hmm. back of your neck. Um, if the breathing and putting ice it, it like what's the word interchanges your your temperatures and it, your body will react a lot better to cold temperatures and it works really well for like calming anxiety very good trick um a couple other ones like envisioning certain things so like again like just staring at a wall but there's two different ones that I use one of them is like you envision a a river or a creek in front of you and a leaf, you drop a leaf into that river or the creek and that that's your anxiety. You look at that as like your issue or whatever, and you just watch it go away. (laughs) And then as soon as it's gone out of your view, as you're breathing, it's like, you should feel better. And another one is throwing a rock into a lake. So just envisioning throwing a rock into a lake and it's going through the water like this. And then it finally hits the ground, but you just, you watch it and you watch it do it very slowly. And like those 30 seconds or to well, one minute, like if you really focus on your breathing while envisioning these weird things, it'll bring you down. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I could see like, like a feather, like falling yes. like that. That's a good one too. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's also, which I find really works too, is four, seven, eight breathing. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Where you breathe out for four, hold for seven. No. 
breathe in for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Mm -hmm. You do it, I think, like twice or three times. If you do it more than that, you you might like pass out. But <laughs> it, it, like it works. It works really well. I do it in the bath all the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> did you have, when you were younger or when you kind of like didn't really know what was happening to you, did you have unhealthy coping mechanisms? I'm sure. Like I definitely was a little party animal. Yeah. I was like, mm -hmm. and I don't know, that's the thing is like, I don't know if that's pretty normal. Like I know a lot of people yeah. who were just like that, but yeah, like when my parents divorced, I just like hung out with friends and drank at a super early age. That was mm -hmm. my thing. But I never really, I know like obviously like addiction, alcoholism, drug consumption for people with BPD is like very common too. Yeah. Um, alcohol is a huge problem for me. Like it just, it's literally like poison to my brain. Like I turn into a, like a totally different person, but I am also like, I get incredibly ill, like physically ill every time. Like oh, it's, wow. I actually think I'm allergic to it, but I also am just sometimes like, no, my brain and my BPD, like with alcohol, it seems like an awful, awful combination. So I don't, I luckily don't have any issues with alcohol. My dad did though. Yeah. So maybe that was the reason why I stepped away from it too. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like any part of your BPD is like genetic or hereditary or anything no I don't think so no it's like I look at my parents and they're both like pretty level-headed yeah they've done some shitty things like parents do but <laughs> no like my mom like I know a lot of people who like you said like it it come it's like predisposed from your family like a lot of parents have depression or anxiety and that gets yeah. passed down but my parents were never depressed they were never anxious they were never abusive they were never Nothing that was that I feel like I, I picked up. I feel like I'm like the one in the family who randomly has mental health issues. <laughs> yeah, that's me too. <laughs> They're like, what happened to you? I'm like, you, you guys know what happened. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how did I well, we turn out? We have a great relationship with my family. Thank God. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. One question I like to ask most people that come on, um, looking back over your whole journey, is there any advice that you would give your younger self or any advice that you wish that you would have received early on? That's a good question. <laughs> um, advice I would give to my younger self is breathe. Like just stay calm. Everything yeah. will be okay. Period. Yeah. I'm such a catastrophizer. Like I make everything worse in my head and I literally have breathe oh, tattooed yeah. on me because I'm constantly reminding myself, calm down. Um, yeah, just chill out. Everything will be okay. And the advice that I wish I got, trust the process. Ooh, I like that one. Yeah. Trust yeah. the timing of your life and trust the process. That's a really good one. For sure. Wow. Everything will be all right. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, I do want to talk about your Instagram page and your art and everything. Yeah! I don't want to make this too long, but okay. your page is called Humble High. Is there a story behind the name? Or how did you start no, that? No, honestly, there's not. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where it came from. I think I'm a big cannabis enthusiast. Cannabis has a big, a big, big part of my life, especially through this whole mental health journey. Even though I was told to not consume cannabis, I did anyways, and it... <laughs> To me, has been a big, big help. Um, so the high part, I think, comes from there. I think I was a play on words about humble pie, like basically me oh, eating a okay. slice of humble pie yeah. and just being like, not everything's good in your life. You've got issues too. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Humble high, why was he? And why did you start that in the first place? So when I, when my partner and I were like the first three years we were together, it was when obviously like all this started to come to fruition and I was diagnosed and I came home one birthday and he had had like, he had bought me a new easel and canvas and all the art stuff. Cause I used to be an artist oh when God. I was younger, but then I stopped, I moved out here. I'm from New Brunswick. I moved out here. I started working. I never painted at all. So he kind of introduced it back into my life and I used all of those tools as such an outlet for my therapy um, and just getting through like the group therapy and stuff. Um, and then finally, like my apartment was just full of art and I didn't know what to do with it. And my dad was visiting and he's like, you need to sell this shit, like get it out of here. So then I started the Instagram page and I started selling the art and then, yeah, I just kind of merged BPD into the whole, the messaging of the account. Um, I wanted some way to be able to, you know, talk about it, but not necessarily on my personal page. I wasn't feeling really comfortable with doing that. So starting a new one and kind of incorporating it with my art felt like the right idea. And I'm so happy I did. Oh, 
I love that. I've never tried art therapy. It's crazy. You don't even need to, you don't need to know how to do anything. Just get art and canvas, throw paint around. Just create something. I think that's what I'll do tonight, honestly. Do you use that when you're in like an episode? Or anything yep. like that? Yeah. Yeah. We have like the house that we bought. There's a studio built in, um, which was really lucky. The, like the person who owned the house before us was an artist. So when we saw this, we were like, oh my God, it's like literally a studio, like a therapist office yeah. built into the house. So yeah, if I'm in it, like getting into a bad zone, I'll just go upstairs and put on music, shut the door, put on the fairy lights and just throw paint around. And it's, it's the oh best. Oh my gosh, that is like, amazing. Like, the whole other world. Do you know what it is about art therapy that that makes it so therapeutic or helpful? Sure, it's different for everybody, but for me, it's like, like, how do I describe it? It's movement. It's the movement of the paint. It's the movement of the color. Um, you know, colors mixing. Just it's art. It's beautiful. And like, yeah, you can go really like a lot of the time I do a lot of like splatter stuff like you can see here this was in the middle of a BPD episode and it was an aggressive paint like it was literally just black canvas white paint throw it like that's how I got my rage out and that came out so it's cool I love it that is so So cool (laughs) oh that is so cool it's almost it's like going to one of those break rooms that we were talking about but not you're actually making something instead of breaking something oh my gosh this should be a thing too yeah (laughs) for sure just go into a room and paint that would be amazing like all white walls and just yes oh my god I'd oh my gosh if you could just throw paint on the wall yeah and then be able to like take it home with you or something that'd be so cool wow oh i would love that Let's copyright this asap <laughs> <laughs> this is such a good idea wow yeah. so is it just painting that you do yeah yeah i do a little bit of sketching here and there again mm-hmm. it's just when I'm feeling like I need a creative outlet. That's so cool. Yeah. And people can buy these off of your Instagram page, right? Yeah. I have everything listed that's for sale on my page. Everything that goes up for sale goes on that page. I don't have a website or anything. So if anybody's ever interested, they can just DM me. I think that's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah. I love it. It's been a huge part of my life and my recovery. Yeah. Do you have like future plans or, or goals for that page? Or you're just continuing? Not really. No, I mean, it's definitely a side gig. It's, you know, it's just my little passion project, I guess yeah. you would say. Um, wherever it goes, it goes. I don't really like to make plans. Okay. I have just one last question for you that I ask every single guest. Yeah. Um, is there a stigma or a misconception surrounding mental health that bothers you the most or that you hear most often but isn't true? Um, yeah, I mean, it's what we were talking about pretty much the whole time is that somebody may look like they've got it all together, that they're thriving when they go home, they're having the best time ever. Um, that's not the case. I would say a large percentage of the people that you know, that look like they have it all together. Don't, Mm -hmm. um, everybody suffers from some sort of mental health, whether it's from anxiety to, um, guilt, shame, you know, depression, um, you know, mourning. There's so many different things that people are going through and just to, yeah, just don't ever judge somebody by what they look like or what they seem like. You have no clue what's happening on the other side. Oh, so true. I love that. <laughs> it is. It's like very, like, that's probably the answer a lot of people say, but my God, it's so true. Look beyond, look beyond the book cover, you know? No, I love that. Okay. Well, that is all the questions that I had for you. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on that we didn't? Mm, I don't think so. We pretty much talked about a lot of stuff. Yeah, we got through a lot. Was there anything anything else like BPD related that you wanted to mention? I think, no, I wanted to talk about night terrors. Um, I wanted to talk about DBT. No, well, not really. Like I, we could do a follow up one maybe in a month or something. Yeah, to talk about that would more be stuff. cute. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's have like a beer some night. We'll talk. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> Um, If people want to reach out to you or have more questions for you, are you open to that? 100% all day. Is Instagram the best way to do that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The DMs are always open over there. Perfect. 
Thank you so much for tuning in today. Feel free to reach out at any time. You can contact me on Instagram and Facebook at Stomp the Stigma YYC, and you can email me at Stomp the Stigma YYC at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. And if you or someone you know would like to come on, I would love to have you share your story, speak your truth, and together we can stomp the stigma.